Welcome everyone uh, to welcome to our first real time session from librarian.support. Uh, the site really came about and these sessions really came about because given the unprecedented nature of the pandemic, what we realized is that many libraries when they close their physical facilities are still very much open in terms of providing virtual services and providing eBooks and chat services in just leaving the Wi-Fi on so that people can use the, the the parking lot and such. But we wanted to, to go ahead and we know that a lot of librarians and library staff are at home uh, and they have this time either directed to or have the ability to do some staff development. And so we wanted to go ahead and be part of that and see what we could do to provide. Uh, as part of that, we called friends and neighbors and really great librarians from around the world. Uh, we're working with our colleagues at PL 2030, Public Libraries 2030, uh, to really bring sort of a European view and a US view together. And that's actually expanding now uh, globally. So we have speakers from the rest of them. Uh, we are, as I say, making this up as we go. So uh, appreciate everyone's patience uh, and informality. If you have tips, suggestions, or ideas, please let us know. Uh, once again, in the lower right hand of your screen, you will see a pink tab. You click on that, you'll get to the chat. We have someone who's monitoring that chat for questions and we'll be raising them if we don't end up talking the whole time. Uh, archives of this will be made available through the librarian.support site. So if you um, aren't able to make future sessions, you'll be able to watch them afterwards. Uh, a few other things that we're working on librarian.support, we're working on an after hours party for our colleagues in New Zealand, Australia, China, and Asia, which is we and this is, I think, two in the morning at this point. So we're looking to set up a session uh, where we get to stay up late uh, so we can have a conversation as well. More details coming. Please check out librarian.support. That is the entire URL uh, and for more information and more details. Uh, our first guest uh, for the for kicking this off is could not have been a better choice and a better volunteer. So thank you very much, which is Matt Finch. Uh, Matt has an amazing biography that I highly recommend you take a look at, uh, has worked in areas of scenario planning, has been a keynote speaker, does a lot of consulting across different domains, certainly libraries, but the communications domain, the energy domain, um, every so often decides to have a conversation with parliament, which I think is extraordinarily impressive, uh, was a uh, creative in residence down in uh, with our Australian colleagues. Uh, and so really thrilled, uh, we, we've run in similar circles, but I think this is the first time we've ever had a chance to really have a conversation. Welcome and thanks for coming, Matt. No, thank you, David. Thank you for having me. And it's, it's really good to be here and, and finally speak to you in real time. It's good. So I, I think that that a lot of what I'm, as we were setting this up and we were having conversations, a lot of folks are certainly present and you know thinking about what we do now, but a lot of it also is thinking about what do we do next? What do we do once this crisis has abated? What do we do once we reopen the doors and moving ahead? And I know that a lot of your expertise and a lot of what you help organizations do is prepare and plan for the future. Um, and I was wondering if you could spend a little bit of time talking about that generally and specifically around the concept of scenario planning. Uh, sure, well, I mean, absolutely. Of my work these days revolves around foresight, which is this question of, of how we prepare for and anticipate and strategize our way into the future across a range of sectors. And one of the things that's becoming increasingly clear is that situations can be so turbulent and uncertain and so novel that they're not going to look like the past. And a lot of predictive models assume that the future will be like the past or be an extension of what has gone before. And as we've seen, whether it's the climate crisis, the pandemic, Brexit, presidential elections, there have been lots of events which have rather blindsided people who seemed reasonable and well-informed and not gone the way that was expected. So increasingly this century, there's been a lot of focus on finding the tools and techniques that let people plan for and accommodate the futures that they weren't expecting, that they didn't hope for, or maybe they didn't even fear. And one of these techniques is called scenario planning. I particularly like it because it has a degree of rigor. So it lets you look at futures that aren't certain to happen. It lets you look at out of the corner of your eye at the future, but it's not just daydreaming. It's not just science fiction. 
Um, Because I think there's a tension between in this this world of data-driven decision-making, you can't gather data or evidence from the future. So so really, data-driven decision-making is actually about faith in your predictive model. And unless you have a time machine or a crystal ball, there's always a leap of faith or a degree of imagination being involved. So, So this technique, scenario planning, lets you deliberately focus on imagining the futures that would be most challenging for you and then bringing them forward and saying, what would we do if this situation came to pass? Or if this situation evolves in the long term, how will people in the future look back on our choices today? Um, So it's a way of bringing uncomfortable futures forward to the present. When I was reading um, some of your articles, and I'm sure you wrote it with the intention of doing this, the, the TUNA acronym came up, which I just loved. Uh, if I got that right, tuna conditions, turbulence, uncertainty, novelty, um, or ambiguity. Is that, did I get that right? Exactly right, yeah. And and that this notion of uh, novelty is really interesting as well. There was a guy, Robert Knight, who in the early 20th century, he's like the father of risk. The way we think about risk this day goes from, comes from this guy, Robert Knight. And Knight says, you know, risk is when you can measure the probable outcomes and you can say there's only this many outcomes and we can kind of assign a number to them. But if a situation is novel, you can't compare it to the past. And if there are uncertain outcomes that you can't predict or assign a probability to, then that stuff is just wild. And and you need something that's not just like, I I know this dice is going to land on one of six faces. Um, So exactly that question of if situations are new or unexpected or uncertain, we're going to need different tools. But I think the nice thing is we use them every day. Like we are all constantly imagining what would the future be like if I make this decision? If I take this job, what will my commute be like? Will I have to sit answering emails all day? Will I like the people I sit with? Like we all do a lot of imaginative modeling of of what's coming next. Can you walk us through a little bit of what that process looks like? I mean, once again, I'm not asking you to walk out of here with the scenario planning, but just at a high level, uh, I think a lot of folks may be familiar with strategic planning, may be familiar with, you know, some level of, you know, let's come up with the mission and vision and break it down, et cetera. Bring a, but but as I, as I used to say, scenario planning, and I love it, that you can't gather data from the future. It really brings the rigor and imagination together. So what, what if you were working within, a, say, a library, what kind of process would you put in place? So I I guess the first thing that you would do is really focus on the purpose of the exercise. Scenarios should be designed to inform a specific decision. It's not like you're just going to go and sit and write some sci-fi stories, or you're going to speculate or daydream, or that you're going to assume you found the one future that definitely comes to pass. So what we say is that scenarios are actually a small group of imagined future contexts. They're designed with a specific user in mind, they're designed for a specific purpose. You have some kind of interface in the sense of you've decided how those stories will be communicated and used. And the final part of the technical definition of a scenario is that is used to inform the decision making. Um, so you may have seen recently, there was an article in the New York Times in the last few days pointing out that the Obama to Trump transition team ran a pandemic simulation. Subsequently, last year, the Department of Health and uh, I think it was called Crimson Contagion. It was literally a simulation of a global pandemic emerging from China. And the Times said in the past four years, two American administrations have run three scenarios for a pandemic outbreak. But if those scenarios don't meaningfully inform the decisions we're taking in the present, then they were just exercises. So going in, before you even start to think about the process, why am I doing these? What specific decision am I seeking for them to inform? And when I come in to work with an organization, that might actually be a large part of the time, really checking we have the right question, what the impact will be, and why we would be telling these stories. You don't just do it to entertain yourself. You don't just do it to create a nice brochure or a nice PDF, which then goes and lives on the shelf behind someone's desk. But it should literally inform a a discussion. And the, the great scenario planner, Pierre Vac, who worked at the oil company Shell in the 20th century, He said when he, you know, after these very long projects with a great deal of money to look at the future at a geopolitical level, when they finally got the executives, the senior executives in to make decisions, 
he said we would start with the scenarios, with the stories of the future, but then very quickly drill down to the underlying factors. And then the rest of the day, we talked about strategy in the here and now. You know, we, we use the vision of the world in 2030 or 2050 to prize open our fixed perceptions about what the future holds. But once that's done, we're, we're not trying to sort of live in Blade Runner. We actually just say, what's that underlying issue that informs that scenario? And then you get to work on that. And, and so the first thing is really to find the purpose or the decision. And then the, the Oxford scenario planning approach, which I'm particularly familiar with, I facilitate on the program at the business school at Oxford. Um, it really involves looking at the ecosystem that the decision maker lives in, all the people they interact with, their users, their suppliers, their regulators, competitors, rivals, their staff, anyone, as my boss Raphael puts it at the Oxford program, anyone that you might shake hands with in your operations, um, you map that entire ecosystem and look at the forces driving their decisions. You know, if, if your organization is the ship which is going to sail into the future, you actually need to look at the possible sea conditions that you'll be sailing through. And therefore, you actually look at the forces driving the decisions of those you interact with, rather than think about your own future in the first instance. And then there are a couple of different methods for assembling those driving forces into challenging futures. You might pick a couple of key factors and say, these are the two factors which will most affect what we do. You know, at a national scale, it could be migration, climate change, whether we're democratic or autocratic. If you plot two factors on an X and Y chart, you can start to say which points on that chart are difficult, like high democracy, major climate crisis, low democracy, low climate crisis, whatever it is. Alternatively, you can assemble multiple factors uh, into different scenarios and say which possible futures would be challenging for us. And you, you go a bit further ahead into the future to get some perspective and get a vantage point. So right now, you wouldn't be thinking about now or the next few months or even necessarily 12 months from now. But, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, how is the world going to look back on what's going on, the decisions we make and the way that plays out? Like it's really about finding consequences rather than short termism, which tends to be reactive. So looking at our, our current situation now um, and thinking about planning for the future. Um, if I hear what you're saying, the idea is one, be concrete. So the notion of saying uh, you know, that, that a library with, you know, 10 librarians, 20 librarians, or one librarian shouldn't probably start with, this is how we serve the universe as it moves forward, but more or less, let's look at how our virtual settings are, you know, our virtual services. Um, what we're doing with ebook loaning, what we're doing with reference and support, what we're doing with, uh, I've seen a lot of people doing virtual story times, et cetera. We're gonna sort of look around that world and think about how today is gonna necessarily change tomorrow, right? So either scenario one, making this up, is uh, you know, in three months from now, everything's passed away, everyone completely forgets what's just happened and we go back to normal. Scenario two is everyone's really shaken and no one wants to leave their house even though they're allowed to, and so that's gonna be increased. Scenario, it, it, is that the kind of process you begin to go through? Yes, but um, often the future that catches up with you is the one that comes out the corner of your eye. So although the pandemic's clearly going to be a factor, it may turn out that the real issues in the long term are not what we expect. But definitely, I think what you say is right, that people are responding very effectively in the moment. Um, but the other thing that Vac said, this, this guy who really formalized scenario planning and, and proved that it worked in a corporate setting in the 20th century, he said scenario planning is like looking at the rain on the mountain and saying three days from now, that could mean a flood in the valley below. And you know the future is not something that comes towards you over the horizon. It actually overtakes you over your shoulder. And in this way, there is a link to an evidence base. And this isn't pure speculation because, because the future is always emerging from weak signals, little events in the present. The future is here. We just may not have detected it yet, or we may not be looking for the right one. So I think in terms of the present moment, whatever size of institution you are, it's about thinking what's upstream from us what could be coming downstream as a consequence of this moment? There are huge public bailouts going on. 
Um, there's a real rebalancing in how and where we work. People may have some lasting family commitments. And so one of these issues is actually, you almost have to look outside of the library sector and go a little bit further upstream and say, what will be the knock-on effects? And one of the things my boss always says really nicely is, you know, it's like watching a sports game. If you can get home, watch it on the HD TV with your favorite drink in your hand in your recliner, great, that's the perfect experience. But if you just want to know the results, you can burn off the data on your cell phone and you can watch it on your cell phone on the bus ride home. And in the same way with scenarios, you might not be able to do a massive in-depth project, but if you stop and think, what's upstream from us? What's going to drive the decision makers who are around us in our ecosystem, it'll help us think about how we're going to emerge from the current crisis, which I think is the real issue. As I say, people have responded very well to now, but what are we going to do three months down the line with an eye on two years or five years down the line? Yeah, Rebecca just in, in the chat commented that one of the factors that a lot of public libraries have to consider is all of these bailouts and all of this public money that we're talking about may then lead to an economic situation where there isn't enough funding or sufficient funding for libraries afterwards, almost a, a repeat of 2008. And so that might be one. Another might be, but if I understand this, another might be, but it could be the opposite, which is I'm thinking in a lot of the Scandinavian uh, countries, investment in public libraries is actually part of their plans for moving to more digital services and it's, it's part of the incentive program so you've got to be prepared and i would imagine then prepared to advocate for some of these as well right well so two points from that example really the first one i know that in norway for example they've just invested a lot in having really nice library buildings so that could go either way depending on if we enter a radically more online world like what are you going to do with all that real estate and architecture you've spent money on um and the the other side of it well actually even sticking with that there's loads of opinion pieces at the moment oh this is going to change how we work forever now it's all going to be video conference we're never going to have conferences anymore i think it's equally likely you know all the pubs are going to close in the uk now the day that they reopen you know, millions of people are going to be going down the pub and people are going to want to be amongst people again. Social distancing will swing back the other way. You know, some of the evolutions are not clear to us. And if we're all looking in the same direction, we'll all have the same blind spot. So one of those things is it's a tension around physical versus digital that actually we must go slower and attend more carefully to what the lasting impact will be, because it's probably not whatever a newspaper columnist decided it was in the first days of the crisis. And the other thing was, Rebecca said there, there's an impact of public borrowing, public debt, possible economic consequences. Uh, Rebecca and I worked together on a project last year. Um, her consultancy, Dysart and Jones, together with the University of Toronto, did a summer school, and we did some scenarios work for Ontario librarians. One of the things that came up was actually, there was a scenario where there was really minimal public funding and libraries were cut to the bone, but in some ways, it was very easy for librarians to see what to do in that situation because it was basically what they already did, but they had to be very ruthless and very efficient because they had so few coins in their purse. There was another scenario where libraries actually ended up with a great deal of money. And this was problematic in different ways because there was greater scrutiny of their work. Other agencies wanted some of that money. People sought partnerships or competed with them. And in some cases it was almost we don't quite know what to do with this amount of money. And I know in America, there have been state libraries where as a result of state politics, a state library has suddenly been given a massive windfall, like a great deal much more money to give away in grants, but they're not allowed to use that windfall to hire any more staff. So suddenly the very small grant team is overwhelmed. Right. Um, have you come across situations like that? Um, I have. Uh, what, uh, what I found very interesting was in, in a few library situations where they had, you know, enough, let's call it enough funding, but frankly, probably more than they probably needed. Um, what I found was actually affected decision making. That when you looked at decision making about what service is moving ahead, what are we prioritizing, those kinds of things, in a very resource hungry situation, starved situation, there tended to be pretty established policies for decision making, whether that was an autocratic director or whether that was, you know, the, the ideas committee things had to go through. In other words, 
every dime had there was rigor to figure out where that dime went in the settings where that wasn't quite the same concern there was a huge absence of that and so therefore decision making took on a very interpersonal tone in other words right. instead of is this going to have the maximum effect for dollars and here's the the method we do it it became well my idea is better than your idea or you got you got to do it last time and so actually from a management standpoint it, it was a very different organization to manage they really had to talk about how to get people lined up around a common vision forward how uh just how to be congenial and civil to each other and so um it's it's a really interesting question yeah it's i think it, it, you see this in the corporate sector as well as you know corporations make some strategic insight that allows them to profit they offer something that people want and then often a successful enterprise becomes a little flabby and loses track of the insight that made it good in the first place or even that insight itself loses value now there are very few library institutions that uh, that have the luxury of being flabby but it's still worth sharpening your insights and one of the things that I saw working with local government in Britain was actually if you went upstream to the people who were deciding how much money was going to the library, that was a good place to do some of your predictive work. Because sometimes, you know, within a city council or depending on, on the organization that you're reporting to, there's someone further up the tree who's going to dole out the cash. Um, and often they would say things as, you know, the UK has gone through a great deal of public austerity. Um, they're actually still very sympathetic people. People were saying, you're gonna have a smaller number of coins, but if you show me that those coins are applied in a way that creates a demonstrable result, you can do something totally innovative, but you just have to understand you've got fewer coins to play with. And so, as you say, weirdly, in those more tense situations, sometimes people pull together better and they actually make better strategic choices. It, it's also, I'm thinking that, one of the this a lot of what I look at and talk with folks are about setting missions and how we create missions, et cetera. And there's a lot of discussion, particularly in academic libraries, around values. How do we prove our value? How do we demonstrate value? And lots of discussion from how do we gather data ethically, can we use it, et cetera. And one of the things that that I hope is a shift, I hope is shifting, is that it a lot of the initial discussion was very reactive. Let's find out what their mission is and shape our mission to find it, right? So going upstream in academic libraries, what is the president's vision? What is the provost's visions? What's these kinds of things? And we're gonna shape ourselves, make sure that we help them accomplish it. And it's been very interesting to try and interject the fact that actually you need to make sure that you're part of putting that vision together. Uh, I'm thinking, once again, given the situation we're in now, a lot of academic libraries are sitting there going, how do we serve our faculty and students when they're not physically here? Well, they've been making those moves for a while, our databases, but we have a VPN to connect them and all this other stuff. The question really becomes, you know, how can these organizations begin to shape the larger mission and make the folks upstream aware of them and aware of the value they bring and interject those values in? Uh, and actually, the UK, I think, has been an interesting example when we talked about the austerity going around councils and councils with local libraries and moving to volunteer-based systems and, and such. The advocacy for libraries has been relative, sorry, I have sensed, but it's been relatively splintered, right? You've got one group that is saying, this is an opportunity for us to get leaner, meaner, be strategic, um, close some branches that historically might have been useful, but not necessarily anymore, move to these different services. And then you've got this other campaigners group that's sitting there going, don't touch our libraries, don't close our libraries, we need a quiet place to read. And um, they're both trying to empower and save the library, but they're almost at loggerheads because there is this no, no common definition of where we're headed. Uh, what scenario, if you will, that we're trying to plan for. And this speaks exactly to, to why you do foresight work and why you trade in imagined futures. Because an imagined future isn't here yet, doesn't have a biting immediate consequence, people can come together and start to talk about what it would be like for us to inhabit that world, even if we have differences of opinion. Um, so Adam Kahane, who is based in Canada, is another excellent scenario planner. He has a book called Collaborating with the Enemy, 
Um, I think the subtitle is something like how to work with people that you don't like or even trust. <laughs> and uh, he does this work, but he did it in Colombia between the government and the rebels. He did it in Thailand when they were on the cusp of civil war. And one of the things he said um, was in the early days of working in Colombia between the government and the rebels, you literally had parties that wanted to kill each other. And the one thing they could agree on was Colombia is in serious trouble and we need to change. Otherwise, Colombia's future is going to be really, really painful. Um, so they, they both knew that the situation was problematic and they needed a better future. And that was the common ground on which they could begin their discussions. Um, and it's for me, as long as we're not quite in the level of a shooting war, <laughs> trying to find a way to play host and accommodate those disagreements is really vital. I mean, we, we say it, and you and I laugh at this, but we also know this is a moment of a shockingly polarized political debate. And there are enormously challenging and controversial issues, which we have to respond to quickly, but also with one eye on the future. Um, and I think that's something which is also really pressing. One of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, in the 90s, with things like Ask Eric, you know, you were such a pioneer, one of the first hundred websites on the internet. In terms of your foresight, if you think back 20 years plus, what did you correctly see coming and which events blindsided you? You know, you were on that first wave of the Internet. What did you foresee and, and what did surprise you? Uh, what I think we foresaw was that the Internet was going to have a large impact as it rolled out. Right? I mean, that sounds obvious. But, uh, you know, I think for me, the, the aha moment was when I picked up a can of Pepsi and it had a URL on it. And I was like, why would a soda company have a URL? Um, and and so I think and, and by the way, I give it 99.9% .9 of the credit of that vision and those services to Mike Eisenberg, who's my advisor and the, and the person who put it together. But we knew it was going to be big, right? We were, and, and it's one of those moments that you felt you were right in the middle of something big going big, right? You could feel it. It was exciting. It fed on each other. And so I think we all felt uh, in Ask Eric and such, we were dealing with education, that education was going to change. And so I think that part we anticipated well. We were on the right side of the equation. When Ask Eric started, we were the way, AOL was another big popular in the homes online network. This was way before they ever connected. And when we sort of divvied up within the Eric system, who does what, we said, we'll take the internet, you guys take AOL. And um, I think we chose well. Um, what blindsided us, and I'm sorry, these are really high and global, um, was how divisive it could become. That, that I think that a lot of folks, and I mean, we can go back to the 70s and folks who are literally building ARPANET and such, but I think there was a, this idealism and how quickly that idealism could be subverted into other factors. Um, not just commercial, because commerce is not bad. It's just a matter of um, how it could become, instead of people coming together and having conversations and discussions, became a way that people could fragment and find their discussions without having to join in them. So globally, I think that's something that we didn't anticipate. Um, we never anticipated the, the search engine world, the fact that the primary tool, the new tool, and the, com and the generator of this would be search engines, would be Google and such, just because you know, it was a whole new world. Um, and so I think those were, were some of the things that, that blindsided us. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's, and we keep running into things like that, but thank you for asking that question. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it's the most valuable thing is to realize, you know, this isn't a fancy way of approaching the future with a strange bunch of esoteric techniques. It's not being a soothsayer but it is drawing on experience and making informed decisions, but also reflecting on our capacity for foresight in the past. Um, Richard Rummelt, who's a great uh, strategy writer, I think he's at UC Irvine now, but he's taught all over the world. He has a basically like almost like a coffee table book of strategy called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, well worth reading. And he talks about this idea of writing down what you think is going to happen even before you go into a meeting just to test your capacity to anticipate. So at the end of the meeting, you say, did it happen as I thought it would? And he says, if you don't do that, 
people tend to think, oh, sure, I considered that. Like we always revise back and think that we anticipated it more than we did. Um, and so I think one of the most valuable things about having people who've got long experience of the sector is that ability to reflect on one's own capacity for foresight. Um, because the future will surprise us. People can be too invested in the existing model. Uh, I think uh, Richard Fould was the head of Lehman Brothers when it went under, and he was literally the most experienced CEO on Wall Street. He was acclaimed, and his bank was the one that tanked and didn't bail out. Um, and so actually using experience in the right way is, is really important. And you noticing that URL on the Pepsi can, that's like one of those weak signals of the future. Like you hold that can and you can almost see that world of QR codes, of the idea of, you know, my God, everything's going to interact even with the products on our shelves. Um, it's, it's that kind of attentiveness, which I think will repay dividends in the future. You know, you'd mentioned uh, Norway and Oslo and the idea that they're building. And I was fortunate to be there uh, beginning of the year when we were still able to get on airplanes. Um, and saw the new Oslo uh, Public Library, downtown library built, et cetera. Uh, but I was there as part of a Oslo Met, uh, the Metropolitan University of Oslo, and their uh, library science program uh, has just conducted a study throughout Norway with Germany and I believe Hungary, uh, looking at the impact of digitization of services uh, on cultural institutions and libraries and museums. Uh, and archives. Uh, it's a fabulous study. Um, I will, when I post this, I will find an actual link and, and put it in there. But I think what they found that they didn't anticipate, they had they had uh, sociologists and people doing participant observation and just sitting in libraries and looking how people use them. They found that as governments in particular were pushing for more and more digital services, the need for the physical spaces was dramatically increased. Um, and that those buildings, so, so one of the, the branches that they re had refurbished was in a gentrified community, but full of a lot of brand new, but very small apartments. And they found that they needed to be the living room of people where they could just get out and read and, and have another space. And so I find that, you know, that's an interesting study. Um, first of all, the fact that we now use the word digitization to mean services and no longer stuff. Uh, right. But it really was fascinating to me looking at this idea that, you know, there are these two things that are balancing each other. It's not either or, and it's not one pushing the other, but they, they had this concert, which raises uh, another thing that, that I was reading um, of yours that was talking about how libraries, as they begin to, to understand and do this kind of planning, with for themselves can really become agents doing it within their larger environments, right? So public libraries helping their cities and other organizations do planning. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the idea of the library as consultant, if you will, within their communities? Of course. I mean, I think this this speaks to the the changing nature of the library as an information institution. You know, and, and you you are the person to speak of this, that evolution in terms of from a repository to a community to a movement. Uh, what does it mean to be a community's conduit to information, knowledge and culture? And if you can't gather data or evidence from the future, that doesn't mean that one can't be informed by a vision of the future in the same way that an individual can be nourished by reading a piece of fiction or um, the guy who discovered the circular a uh, form of benzene. It came to him in a dream. He had a dream of Aruberos, of the serpent swallowing its own tail. And he went, oh my God, that's the structure of benzene. That's the anecdote. So a, a data can inform scientific discovery. A dream can inform scientific discovery without being hard data. You know, libraries can also give people access to that. And because libraries are still seen as a welcoming public institution, they can convene communities in a way that a school or a healthcare institution or city hall can't necessarily. And I saw this very clearly in Mississippi, um, working in rural Mississippi last year. Um, I saw how certain parts of the community would be willing to come to the library, but they felt very unwelcome at City Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, Jacob Starks at Neshoba County, Mississippi, Philadelphia, Mississippi, um, was thinking about how he could offer some City Hall services 
over the counter in this very, you know, like not the fanciest library in the universe, really rural Mississippi. You can imagine what public funding is like there. You know, they're not going to be the first library to have drones uh, or you know <laughs> holograms or something like that. Right. But they'd really thought about where do we make a difference? And one of the things is being that place of welcome. You said earlier, you know, if you go upstream, you don't want to just copy the other people's vision, but you need to be part of that discussion. And there's that old joke, you know, if you aren't at the table, you're probably on the menu. Um, if, a, if a library brings together the community and says, together, we're going to think about the future in terms of this decision that the community needs to make, the library can get local journalism, city data, uh, the library can find the sources of information which are like that Pepsi can with the website on it, the sources of data in the present which tell us these are the signals of which future might emerge. And the more members of community you can have there, including people who disagree, the better the chance you have of creating a rich future uh, that you can properly discuss when you're thinking where do we want to go as a community. Um, and one of the things scenarios do as well is, is they're not judged in terms of prediction, but in terms of plausibility, which is to say, instead of trying to hit on the one future that actually comes to pass, um, that's like, you know, that's like trying to hit the bullseye with a stray arrow over your shoulder. Instead, you look for scenarios which are challenging to your assumptions, but useful for decision making. So you don't worry about a scenario for, you know, Atlantis rises up from the ocean depths or little green men descend from flying saucers over the Statue of Liberty. But you can look at wild things and you can say, you know, if you were planning, thinking about the digitalization of education, which is a project I just did in Oslo, actually things like pandemics, things like geopolitical change, things like the consequences of climate change, they might create a provocative state of affairs which let you think about the decisions you have to make here and now. Um, so one weird example, very briefly, we did scenario planning for public libraries in New South Wales, Australia, and we went out 10 years ahead, and one of the groups wanted to look at their diversity and inclusion plan at the city council. And by a strange series of circumstances, one of their scenarios involved, there was a, a really foolish war in the Asian region between the US and Chinese sort of proxy forces. And there was actually a military attack on Australia, just one, then the conflict stopped, it didn't get out of hand, but it was a massive shock to the national psyche. And over 10 years, Australia drifted towards being a Chinese client state instead of an American client state. And at the end of it, in this coastal town, we were saying, so 10 years from now, Right now, you get an American warship that visits your harbor and everyone celebrates the American sailors are in town and they come and attend the sports game and stuff. Ten years from now, it's a friendly Chinese warship in your harbor and Australia is much more aligned to China. What's the trickle down from the national government to the city government to who is in your town, who are friendly foreigners? What does that mean for policies like diversity and inclusion? What would be the new tensions in your society? So sometimes quite wild things help you think about quite practical questions in the here and now. Right, because I mean, all of those issues of foreign national immigration, et cetera, flaring in Australia and around the world. So, oh, so that's great. Sorry. I'm just thinking about library as movement. Um, yeah. how, how do you see that having a future focus in terms of where you anticipate things might head? Um, whether whether it's where you would like it to head or where you fear it might head, um, how do you see libraries' movement sort of having that future focus? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm I'm interested in libraries' movement is is that idea of, and it's got a lot of phrases to it. And and Marie, uh, I think maybe online now, and will but she'll be one of our speakers coming forward. So she's the one who really developed that initial thought in Aarhus in in Denmark. But it is that idea of collective action that we we come together and we want to develop a preferred future and then we we act to make that happen. And no library can do it on its own. We need to really have partners across the spectrum. And so the library becomes the framework in which librarians and plumbers and teachers and politicians or whatever are pushing for and advocating for this common future. Um, and where I think that becomes really interesting and, and relevant here is that notion of collective mission, collective planning that leads to a collective mission. Because one of the things I'm 
absolutely fascinated with. Um, I know in New South Wales, they were just working on sort of what is the library network of the future look like and how do they support it, which I think is a very interesting question when you turn it from what kind of services do our libraries need from us to what kind of society do we want to live in and therefore what do these organizations need to do and therefore what do we have we support it. Um, and I'm thinking of what I would love to say is a growing trend, but it's the notion of looking at public libraries really developing the plan, strategic plan or whatever for the entire community, right? So it's not just this is what the library is going to do. It's like we're going to have a versatile, versatile economy and a vibrant economy. We're going to have uh, people ready for education and can read. And yes, the library plays a part in it, but everyone else does. And it comes from having these conversations. And, and one of the big takeaways I'm getting from this is by introducing scenarios as a methodology of rigor, it allows you to provide just enough distance from today that you can have a conversation, but is relevant to today and that it identifies factors that you, you have to consider. And so when we sit down, uh, Topeka, Kansas and Gina Millsap, who's the executive director there, when she started doing this, it was in response to the notion that everyone kept saying, well, government doesn't do anything. The city government is stuck. The state government is stuck. And she stood up and said, we are government. The, the public library is the government. And so therefore, we have a role to bring people together, set priorities, lay out agendas. And I'm just, I, I think we, I know I talk a lot about this, being a community, doing a movement. You know, we, we, we've got the ethic behind it. We've got some of the theory behind it, but then putting the methodology to it to say, all right, that's great. How do we now pull people together and decide where that where we're moving to? If we're a movement, in what direction? And how do we come right. up with that common vision? Yeah. And I mean, precisely that there has to be ultimately one part of strategy is focus. Like eventually one has to make a decision, one has to take a bet on which future is emerging. We all do it every day. You know, I, I prepare my coffee the night before, ready for the next morning. And I expect that no one is going to have stolen my coffee pot overnight or, you know, like we make bets large and small about which future emerges. Eventually, leadership is about taking that informed decision on the basis of incomplete evidence and preferably as a collective, you know, speaking, especially in terms of democratic societies, there may be some disagreement and tension at any one time, but enough of a common ground that we can say this is the future we want to move towards. I love that notion of the direction. And one of the questions it makes me want to ask, I can think of some really good examples like um, Stephanie Chase at City of Hillsborough in Oregon, uh, who I think is actually, she's just gone from heading the libraries there to going off and consulting in her own right across local government. But she did a pretty good job of getting a seat at the table with the chief of police, with the other representatives of the city. What would you say in terms of swimming upstream, and making that initial play that actually we need to be part of this conversation and we should, how how do public libraries get some credibility uh, in doing that? I'm reminded of, uh, actually it was, a, I'm, I'm going to blank on, on it, I apologize, but it was a British library, public library, and they were talking about how they had to build a really tight connection to the city council. Um, and part of it was the idea that they would do incident reports. If there was a fight out in, in the parking lot, if there was a topic mentioned, they would do these incident reports and share it with the counselor. The idea being that when the counselor's in the pub and having a beer, we don't want that to be the first time he or she hears about topic X, Y, or Z. And so therefore, they were creating this kind of connection within it. Um, I was talking with actually Jason Broughton, who's the Vermont State Librarian, will be with us on Thursday. And we were talking about what that role looks like, because a lot of libraries will say, we are the facilitators of this community. We can come and, and we do that. And the answer is not necessarily. Are you embedded into government? Do you have strong connections with this? And we were really began talking about the sort of a new role of a community navigator, community facilitator, someone whose job it is to really pull expertise and individuals from across this institution, organization to make it happen. And that a lot of those skills may be library skills, but not all of them. And there are other skills that, that need to come on board. I, I'm curious about, 
because I know that you you know you've done a lot of working. Um, we'll talk. Actually, this might lead into a conversation of Library Island, which is uh, fascinating. But, but you know, what are the skills that people need um, to span across the library and truly connect um, all of government? I, I, above all, it must be about relationship building, I think. Um, and I think this is something I've taken away from your work as well, is that increasingly it's not about we have the precious stuff behind the counter, which you want to get at. And it's not even that necessarily you are going to make the precious stuff. It's almost not about the precious stuff, but about the relationship and the quality of connection that one builds as well. And for me, the the best experiences I've seen in terms of of foresight work is where you you reach out you think about what is going on outside of your sector you put yourself in the other person's shoes whether this is at an individual level or an institutional level and really focus on that dynamic and think in terms of futures you know as i said what is the sea we're going to be swimming through in the future i think one of the the things that everyone on this call probably myself included always needs to remember it's very easy to stay within the bubble of your sector or within the bubble of your geographic region. It's one of the great things about this project is it brings people together. I think one of the things to do is build relationships, but also look elsewhere. Think about where you're not looking. Think about the things that seem too far upstream for you to think about. The other stakeholders who might see things that would be in your blind spot. I think that's one of the real challenges is, is finding a way to bring in that perspective. But if you if you start by listening to people and thinking about where they're coming from, um, one of the things I found working in healthcare, I was doing some work with a hospital in Connecticut. They had an amazingly high standard of patient-centered care, but terrible internal conflict, like the head of the pharmacy didn't get on with the head of the surgery, all this kind of stuff. And we really had to boil it down to almost, how does this person behave with you? How do you behave with them? And then what's going, under, going on underneath the surface with the pair of you? because I always think that my motives are sound, they're pure, I'm a good person, I know where I'm coming from, you're the pain in the backside, you're the one making my life difficult. But I think librarians' capacity for empathy, which is probably at its most developed in public librarianship, is actually one of the great strengths, even at the level of institutional advocacy. I, I don't know how you feel about that. I, it's interesting because um, I've been having this conversation more and more often and what's been really useful to me is to distinguish between empathy and compassion. I was listening to a Yale psychologist who was making the difference, and he was talking about, speaking of medical contacts, he was talking about people working on oncology and palliative care and really tough, dark times. And he said, if you are empathetic, that is, if you take on the emotions of others and you feel their pain literally, it's exhausting. It, it, is, it is problematic and it's burnout time. He goes, however, if you understand and identify with those emotions, which is compassion in his definition, it makes you better, right? So the idea is when you have someone who's really sick, being able to sit there and go, oh, I feel so bad because you feel so bad and isn't it horrible? Not necessarily the most helpful setting as opposed to, I understand you're feeling really bad and that motivates me to help try and figure out how to make you feel better, to solve this, et cetera. And I think that, that as we in library science education this is cruel this is crucial as we've been preparing librarians and library staff to work in a more community movement focus to be more relationship oriented to me facilitation is the new core skill of librarianship that adds into information seeking and behavior we need to be really clear about the difference between empathy and compassion because what we're really talking about is people who can be high functioning in difficult situations uh, and right. not burn out throughout that process. I wanna make sure that, that folks um, who may be listening, we are monitoring the, the chat group. So if you have questions, pop them in there and we wanna get it in because we're, we're, we're coming up to the 10 o'clock mark. Um, can you talk, uh, while I wait for those, can you talk a little bit about the Library Island? Um, sure, um, it was area? a project that started in 2016. Uh, at the State Library of Queensland to create a simple immersive role play that let people visit an imaginary island and run its three public libraries. It's just cartoony and broad enough that it lets people play quite simply. It's not like you have to play a serious role play, but you experience real problems. Um, an indigenous group seeking some recognition, 
issues of budget, natural crises. Um, it's available as a, a Creative Commons licensed PDF, but it lets people really experience true uncertainty. Like it was meant to be an activity where the facilitator themselves couldn't predict the outcome. So rather than an instructional paradigm, something more like the traditional library approach, where one goes forth and explores and discovers something for oneself, which is something we did even when we were taking books off shelves. So it's still in the same spirit, but it's experiential and it's about relationships. So this also ties into that question of foresight and scenarios is, is letting yourself play with uncertainty, letting yourself sit in uncomfortable situations and using the fact that a future or an imaginary island is fictional to take the heat and the bite out of these things. Because we do live in very riven societies at the moment. And one of the challenges is how do we continue to have conversations with people we disagree with, potentially at a very fundamental level? Um, this happened in, in Oregon. There was a Library Island game where somebody was playing a, a very right-wing member of the public who wanted books to be destroyed in a library collection. And the staff just rejected her and completely didn't engage her. And it made her reflect afterwards. I think I come from a very liberal background, but I think I'm very accommodating to all members of the public. But actually thinking about how I was treated with this ludicrous request, how do we manage someone who comes in with these views without sort of necessarily failing to engage? Um, and I think this comes back to your question of compassion is the idea of identifying, but with enough distance that one doesn't become caught up in it. And also the notion of compassion that it is about identifying. It is not that we have decided this is, we have a notion of kindness, which we are going to put on the community. But part of our work is with a degree of professional distance still to resonate with what's going on with you. And that is maybe the skill that we're really talking about. In uncertain times, how do we connect? remain resilient enough that we're not thrown off course by violent or disturbing or challenging events or characteristics that people have but continue to move in a given direction you know the library as movement as a trajectory um so we only have a few minutes left uh I, and you've done so many brilliant things so i mean it's a mutual admiration society that we're going to rename this whole discussion the mutual Admiration Society for all, all our friends and neighbors. But can you talk to me about um, the other project I thought was really interesting was Fun Palaces. Um, because one, it's fun, but it, to me, it's it's taking a lot of these ethos and talking at a community-wide basis and not necessarily just what can happen within walls. Can you talk a little bit about that project as well? Sure. So uh, my last engagement with Fun Palaces was about four years ago, but I spent a couple of years working quite hard uh, with this movement, which is led out of the UK. Um, the principal spokesperson for this uh, would be Stella Duffy, uh, who's a writer and a theatre person who takes on many roles. It's an evolution of a 1960s concept by a theatre director, Joan Littlewood, and an architect, Cedric Price. They had this idea of a cultural institution which would be mobile, which wouldn't just be a pile of stones in a city centre or a capital city, but would go to where the community was. 30, 40 years later, that finally took form. And it was in the form of communities coming together in a sort of self-initiating way to share their skills, to let people learn, play, and explore on their own terms. And the, the movement is built around one weekend, normally the first weekend in October each year, but increasingly um, with a wider range of offers and opportunities. But the idea was really not for professionals to talk down, but for the community themselves to say, this is what I can do and I can share it with you and we can learn from one another. And of course, the public library has been a natural marriage for that, because to me, the great difference between a library and another learning institution is the paradigm that a person comes to the library to explore on their own terms. Even if they're just double checking something they think they know, like what was the capital of Peru or my professor told me I had to get this textbook out. There's always an element of discovery rather than the expert instructing you. And so fun palaces were an opportunity for people in both the arts and sciences to come together, people who do have skills and qualifications, or people who just have a natural talent or a natural curiosity, and to indulge that together in, in the spirit of a collective. So it chimes well with libraries movement. And of course, it's a really, it's a really good time to be attending to things like that, because one of the things you and I were talking about beforehand was that when we think about future uncertainty, 
We also have to think about the vulnerability of freelancers, precarious workers, temporary workers. So people involved in the fun palaces movement will also include people in that category. And however shaken we feel in our institutional roles, there are people who really go paycheck to paycheck by singing for their supper, by doing project work, who are unaffiliated. And I, I think one of the things the sector does have to think about in the short term is, is how do we protect and help people who are in that circumstance. I, I thank you very much for raising that because that is to me crucial. I think of I think of libraries and librarianship as an ecosystem, and we tend to think in relatively simplistic, somewhat style, siloed terms of that. Well, you have librarians and you have library staff, and they work in a library and et cetera. And yet, it it very much consists of folks like yourself, um, and you know, Eric uh, is going to be on here soon, who does work across oceans uh, that idea of freelancers consultants uh, folks that are really come in they give us a burst of new ideas they ha help us walk through really hard tasks and problems and and librarianship many libraries would be impossible to function without them and so one of the things that that um, I, i've asked Matt, to help a little bit is we're going to try and put on library support we are not going to try we are going to put on library support a listing uh, directory of folks who are in a position where they can share their expertise, they can share this kind of work, and we can really try and raise some awareness about that. One of the services that that I would love to talk to you about is um, you're doing video. You, you know, even now, people can you can be working with people. You're doing video coaching and working with people online, correct? Yes, so one of the things that has evolved, and it's as much to do with issues like climate change uh, as well, is finding ways to connect with people and facilitate and have these discussions about the future remotely. Um, so uh, the last couple of years, I was working on the strategic plan for the Supreme Court Library in Queensland, Australia. And we had an opportunity there to really talk to the highest levels of the court, talk to a range of stakeholders and, and produce the plan for the next five years. And one of the things this pandemic crisis will also do even if we go back to more face-to-face -face work, is it will hone our skills in terms of doing what you and I are doing now. And I mean, the way you've managed this webinar demonstrates that there's a lot of expertise going around in the library sector, and that maybe other parts of city council, other parts of universities, other parts of our institutions should be learning from those librarians and information professionals who are already good at doing this kind of video conferenced work. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to connect even when we're not in the same room. And I think that's also part of it. The other thing that occurs to me about the idea, it's really important to bring together freelancers and include them in the ecosystem, as you said. There are lots of freelancers I see on social media now who work with museums, with galleries, with other sectors, who would actually be of great use to libraries, even if it was for a local history project, for a digital story time, for some small, even if it's that local community art teacher who comes in and does something in a branch once a week, if there was a home to bring in freelancers from other sectors and show them what libraries are, it's almost like recruiting them to the library's movement. And it's also demonstrating what the library does to a wider audience. So I think our hope is by having a kind of clearinghouse or at least a listings page, that some of those specialized skills might be brought into library land um, where they haven't seen themselves there before. I love it. I love it. I look forward to, to working with you on that. I look forward to making that available. Thank you so, so much for being our inaugural speaker on this one, uh, guest. Um, I learned a lot and uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time. No, no, it's been a delight. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. All right, um, the, the, we'll make sure this archive is available so you can share it widely. Uh, on Thursday, Jason will be joining us from, the, who's the State Librarian of Vermont, to talk about all sorts of issues, including how we prepare people uh, for working in crisis situations and preparedness. We have a, you know, lots of folks. Please check out library, librarian.support uh, for more upcoming sessions and additional materials. And I'm going to say our first one was a success. So thanks again, Matt. Have a great day. Thanks, Bye for now.